Hey, Michelle. Hey, Justin. Guess what time it is? <gasps> what time is it? It is time for episode seven of Plant Prescription, the official Costa Farms podcast about houseplant care. Ah! If you can't see me, I'm doing the meme thing now with a guy with a ah. Okay. I can't believe we are already on episode seven. Uh, you know, we're practically grizzled professionals now. <laughs> I really love your word choice of grizzled. It's the most flattering grizzled thing. Grizzled is a I've, great word. <laughs> I've never been called grizzled, and I hope to never be called grizzled again. But the fact that it's coming from you is okay. Excellent. <laughs> All right. As always, we're going to be answering some questions, busting a myth, and talking about plants. Um, so to kick off episode seven... Uh, we have a question from Alicia in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, Alicia says, hey, I bought a red earth star a while back, but it's gone green. It's no longer red. How do I get the red color back? Uh, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I don't know what a red earth star is. Like All I can imagine is like this little red galaxy, crazy looking plant. Um, I don't know what it is, but, uh, if it's supposed to be red and it's gone green, I've had a couple of cannas that have done the same thing. I have like the dark leaf cannas and they go green. And most of the time when I see that happen, it's because it's in lower light. And then when I move it to higher light, it turns red again. So I would guess that's what's happening. Uh, Justin, do you, what is red star? <laughs> You are absolutely 100% correct, Michelle. So red okay. earth star is a type of bromeliad. It's a pineapple relative. Um, and interestingly, we grow it in two different programs here at Costa Farms. Uh, we grow it in our cacti and succulent mix, which tells you that it likes a lot, a lot of light. Uh, we also grow it in our exotic angel plants collection. Um, I've seen two variations here at Costa Farms, the red star and the pink star. Um, and yeah, both of them will will go to a nice, lovely olive green color if they don't get as much light as they want. Now, happily, the light doesn't need to be sun. It can be artificial light, or you can do a mix of artificial and natural. As long as there's enough intensity, um, it will help the, the red and the pink pigments come to the top of the leaf. Um, and so you get that nice coloration back. Okay. It's a bromeliad. That it is. That makes a lot of sense. Botanical name is cryptanthus. Cryptanthus. Yes. Which always I... feels like it should be some sort of insect pest to me. Uh, it does. Why is cryptantha, why is that like flashing at me? I don't know why cryptantha, is that another plant genus that I'm just, it's right on the outskirts of my, my, my mental capacity right now. Cryptantha. Uh, Cryptantha is not ringing a bell to me, but it could very well be. There are so many plant names. Oh, Raphidophora. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Woo. Okay. I, was, I wasn't going to be able to move on if I could if we couldn't get past that. <laughs> so Cryptanthus, uh, right? Yep. Is bromeliads? Okay. So Correct. Raphidophora, Cryptantha, Cryptanthus, bromeliads. I just learned something for life. Thank you, Justin. So Alicia, if you can give it more light, uh, you should get that nice, rich ruby red color back. Yep. I, yeah, that's what I would, that's what I would do, Justin. <laughs> Good luck all right. With your cryptanthus. Question number two. This one has your name all over it, Michelle. Oh yeah. Is it bugs? Um, it comes from Cynthia in Henderson, Nevada. She says, Hey, I got a plant. I saw a couple of white thread-like bugs in, in the, the soil. It's a fiddle leaf fig. Uh, what are they and how do I get rid of them? They're really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> Why does everybody get so freaked out over bugs? Okay, well, let's, let's take a step back. Let's take a deep breath here. Don't panic. It sounds like these could be springtails. Um, if they're like silvery whitish looking and they're in your soil, they're Probably those. And the reason I say don't panic is because these guys are probably not doing anything to your plant. Um, probably. It's hard to ID it if I don't have a photo, but it sounds like that's what it is. Um, and springtails, very akin to their name, 
spring because of their tail. Uh, it's really <laughs> just to, if you, if you want to know. I'm totally imagining Tigger now. Yeah. Tigger, like a flea looking Tigger, but they're not fleas. They're not even close to fleas and they're not going to bite you. I shouldn't have said fleas because now I know like before you're like panicking and now you're like really panicking because I said fleas and don't panic. They're not fleas. They're not going to bite you. And they're probably not car causing harm or damage to your plant. Um, but really cool way to tell if there are springtails is um, eh, we either talk about poop or butts, and this one's going to be butts. Uh, well, if you want to, if you can get a couple of insects, either chase them around on the soil surface with your finger, or I don't know if you can get them onto another surface, um, try to poke their butts. Um, and you're going to know it's their butts because they have little antenna on their heads. And so that's their head. Don't poke their head. Don't, don't be that person, but poke their butts, um, on the other end. And if they jump like spring forward, hence the name springtail, it's a springtail. Um, these guys will feed on, um, like decaying stuff, which I know also is a scary word, but it's, it, it's just what happens in plant media. Um, and they're not, again, they're not going to hurt you. Um, they, they're not going to cause any harm. They're just going to be hanging out in the plant. And if you ever get bored and you're wondering what do I do, it will give you a source of entertainment because you could just go and like poke their butts and just watch them hop everywhere. Um, but probably springtails, they don't bite. They're not harmful. Uh, may help just like Justin said, they may actually help with your plant. Um, and that's all I got. You know, also, I, you don't have to kill every bug. Um, just keep that in mind. If you do want to lower your numbers of springtails, right? If you have a lot of them and you want to just like have less of them, one good way to do it is just by letting your soil media dry down. Like let it go dry. Fiddle leaves can handle it. Ugh, ish. Let it go dry. And then do a deep watering. And try to water your plants like that because they really don't handle dry downs very well and they're going to die if you do that. Maybe not all of them, but it'll help knock the populations down if that's what you, if you just don't want them. Um, insecticides are going to be kind of tricky with it. Uh, you're better off just letting it dry down and then wetting it and then dry down and then wetting it, like cycling that water or moisture. Um, and thank you for the reminder that just because you see an insect doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. You don't have to kill it. Yes. Although I do find it fun that you said, don't poke it in the head, but then you did talk about trying to kill it. Well, I, well I'm just trying to help here. I'm just, uh, look, I'm, I'm looking at it from all sides. You know, I know that I am not the regular person who, hates all bugs or uh, hates a strong word. I have a different um, relationship with bugs that most people do. And I understand most people are not huge bug fans. So I'm just trying to, to see it from both sides and to help them out with their quote unquote bug problem, quote unquote. Totally fair. You are you are spreading the message of insect peace to the to the world. <laughs> oh, insect peace. Alrighty. All right. What's up next? Third question: uh, Does xanthosoma um, go dormant in winter? Uh, this is from Tabitha in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, which is just a short drive from where I went to college to get my horticulture degree. So go Wisconsin. Oh, that's awesome. What a small world. We had somebody from Asheville on here too. And I was like, Asheville. Um, uh, they could okay, have been so your neighbor. Could have. Could have been. I forgot what the question was, but hey, neighbor, I'm here. <laughs> if you need help, I got you. Uh, okay. So uh, Xanthosoma, aka Caladium. Um, a lot of Caladiums do go dormant. And I think most of the time that's because obviously a change in the seasons. They're like, bears in that sense. I listened to a bear podcast today. It's, it's hot in my mind right now. Um, so a lot of caladiums, AKA xanthosomas will go dormant if they're not given the right amount of light and or 
heat. And so with this one, I think, you know, if you keep it well lit under bright light and you keep it warm, it shouldn't go dormant. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in in your area um, of Wisconsin, um, it may be fine if you have a big bright window. If you don't have a big bright window, you may want to augment with some some artificial light. Um, and for those of you who who may not be familiar with the term dormant, uh, because it's it's not a word we use a lot with house plants, um, it basically means the plant goes to to sleep um, and it will lose its leaves. Um, in the case of xanthosoma, it's only the the roots that are alive. And so when your plant goes dormant, it looks like it's gone completely dead. Um, but the roots are just having a nice little uh, a nice little slumber until conditions are happy enough for them to put up some some new growth again. Um, it can be challenging to know um, when a when a plant goes dormant versus dead because uh, <laughs> you don't see it happen a lot in in house plants. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, is my plant dead or is it sleeping? It's <laughs> a lot of questions could be asked like is this dead or is it sleeping? Uh and unlike other things you can't just poke it with a stick. It's not going to do anything. So, um yeah, I mean, is there a way that you would kind of try to check if a plant was dormant or if it was dead? I think if a plant was dead, I think that it would take a little bit longer I think that you would see it kind of like wilting when I go, when I see plants go dormant, I don't see them like wilting. I don't see brown leaves. I just see less leaves and then no leaves. Yeah. It's, it's usually a, a relatively quick process. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're really in question and you don't want to be patient and wait until spring to see if your, your plant puts out some new growth, you can dig it out of the soil. Uh, once a plant dies, there's nothing kind of protecting or fueling the roots. And so they'll, they'll rot out pretty quickly. Whereas if it's dormant, the roots will still be uh, white and thick and fleshy um, yep. and alive. Um, you know, so that's the, the best way. However, you don't necessarily want to be putting that kind of stress on your plant if you don't have to. Yeah. You could always take them out and poke them with a stick. <laughs> Is is that what they were recommending on the Bear podcast you you listened to? <laughs> no, it was really ironic that you let off with Grizzly because I was like, oh wow, everything is coming up bears today. Uh, no, I I think that they even when they would go into dens, they would still hit them with tranquilizer darts just to be safe. <laughs> so no, as the phrase goes, don't poke the bear. Um, oh, I hope that oh, I wish they they had covered that where that came from, because um, that must have come from somewhere. Anyway, we're not here to talk about bears. Bears. <laughs> bears and bears Battlestar are not Galactica. House <laughs> like Dwight Schrute, bears and Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> anyway, okay, so dormant plants akin to bears, but not even remotely in a sense. Um, all right. Uh, What's up? Is that is that it? <laughs> Sorry, I guess I got uh, bears on the mind now. It's that's, question, <laughs> that's question number three. Um, so that means it is time to bust a myth. Okay. Um, and one myth that I see from time to time online um, is that I should pl spray my plants every month with neem oil um, to make sure that I don't get any pest infestations erupting. Take it away, Michelle. I can see that you are eager <sighs> to jump in on this one. Why? Okay. So, all right. This kind of circles back to IPM as a whole. We're going to get really deep on this one, only because it's really important to understand the different ways of looking at plant health. So there's two ways of looking at it. There are, there's like the traditional, um, you just apply chemicals, apply chemicals, apply chemicals, and you just assume the bugs aren't there and you just go on your merry way. And that is the traditional method, which the whole industry is moving away from that right now. Now, the the method that Costa Farms takes and that we're, you know, a lot of people in the industry, a lot of horticulturists are taking is taking a more holistic approach. Instead of just spraying blindly, knowing if something is there or not, 
you invest in, <laughs> it's crazy, looking at your plants, um, which as something I need to do also more often. Uh, I have 500 though, in my defense. So anyway, there's the new method is, or the new approach is to look and monitor your plants. And only if there's a problem that comes up, you treat that, be it biologically, chemically, whatever, physically, you know, removing leaves or removing a plant in some cases. Um, and so those are the two approaches. And so it sounds like this idea of spraying neem oil constantly on a plant that I hate to sound really opinionated, but it's kind of outdated um, because that historically has not worked for us or any, not everybody in the industry because you develop resistance. Um, bugs will develop resistance. It's a waste of um, resources. You also have the uh, scary thought and the uh, the scary opportunity of phytotoxicity, like burning your plants with too many chemical applications. And I've seen a lot of plants that were grown traditionally with just, you know, blindly treating them with chemicals. They tend to be less healthy, which is ironic. You would think that they would be healthier because no bugs are on them ever because you don't let that happen. But there's some interaction between constant chemical applications. In this case, neem oil, I don't want to say same thing, but similar concept, constant applications where it does something to the plant where the plant is stressed from these constant applications. And also if you do it every month, I mean, you're going to get some life cycles in there. It, like what pest are you going after? Where are you spraying it? Why are you spraying it? Are you even getting good coverage? <sighs> Look, you can do that you're always, everybody's always welcome. Growing is such a magical field because everybody grows in a different way. And that's a beautiful thing. There's like a million ways to skin a cat. There's a million ways to grow a plant. You can do that, but I would caution against it because you could end up hurting your plant. What are you even targeting? Um, and it, I would just caution to challenge yourself instead of just spraying because you're afraid of something learn about that thing and learn about how to identify it. And then you know what to apply to it. You know, instead of just spraying oil, you could go in with something else that's way more effective than oil. Um, end rant. You can, I don't know why you would, I don't think it's necessary, but you are your own person End rant. So I, I understand the I understand the desire to to try to prevent any pest infestations from happening. Um, but one of the things that I find is is kind of interesting is that a lot of people are really comfortable with the idea of neem oil um, and they don't think about it as a chemical. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and it it is a chemical compound. Um, it may be a chemical compound found in nature, but it is a chemical compound. And um, the the whole point of using it, whether you use it um, intentionally to treat a pest or um, in the case of, of this misperception, preventatively to try to prevent a pest. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you're I said applying a chemical. Towards... Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're applying something that may not need to be there. Um, are you wasting your money? Maybe. Are you wasting your time? Good chance, maybe. Um, is it really doing anything? It depends on your coverage, depends on the pest you're going after. Um, what it could be doing is hurting your plant. Um, and the other thing, <sighs> I'm just going to keep repeating myself. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> the other thing to think about, too, um, is that not all um, and, and this is one of Michelle's favorite things. Not all bugs are bad. Not all insects are bad. Um, it could be because Costa Farms uses beneficial insects. It could be that if you see something on your plant, it's actually a beneficial that is doing the same thing that neem oil would if there was a pest. Yeah. And so, that's why I mentioned, you know, instead of just spraying and uh you know, just going with that traditional method, challenge yourself to learn what are these things and what is the best method for these things? Because neem oil kills everything. Well, except for mealybugs. 
and scale. Uh, anyway, so it will kill a lot of things though. And it's really non-selective versus, you know, if you know you have uh, aphids, uh, you could go for something that's really selected for that. And that'll do a better job than neem oil will. Um, and it's going to challenge you to kind of learn what these pests are and then learn what the best options out there are because neem oil. Yeah. It's literally a cover. It's going to kill everything, but is it going to do it better than say another chemical? Probably not. Maybe not. Depends on your pest. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. All right. So plant update time. Uh, Michelle, do you have any any fun updates, anything new, anything going on with any of your, what, 500 plants that uh, that are in your lovely little North Carolina home there? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, this is horrible. I have so many plants. I It's about 500. I haven't counted in a while. It sounds it takes like a long you might need to, uh, you know, to do a plant tour pretty soon. Yeah, and maybe we can cut them all off as I go. <laughs> number one, number two. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, yeah, we could probably do that in the future. That'd be easier than me kind of trying to uh, look at 500 of them every day for an update. Yeah, that sounds fun. If you guys want to do that, we could do that one day. Um, here on, on my side, I have uh, one of my Hoya is blooming right now, which is always fun because the, the flowers are nicely fragrant. Um, it's hanging in my, in my front window and it's been blooming for a while. Um, but the flowers are long lasting and they come in nice little bursts. So yeah, oh. that's just a nice little, just a nice little thing. Um, you know, flowering houseplants are kind of unusual. You don't tend to see a lot of them because the lower light levels we have in the house means um, it's better cued for for most foliage plants. So whenever I get flowers, I, I tend to do a little happy dance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm a child, but I can't say that. I can't even hear that without thinking, oh, yeah. Um, so I've never had a Hoya flower. I'm not going to lie. I'm not a Hoya head. Don't have a lot of them, but I've heard that the flowers are like, they take a long time to pop, don't they? Or am I wrong? They do. No, it can be a, it can be a very slow-mo process. Oh man. Which, that is you know, adds exciting. to the fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is. And you said they stayed open for a while. How long do they stay open for? Probably a couple of weeks. Really? Which I know is not as long. Well, because there's a cluster and, you know, they don't all open at the same time. Are they fragrant for that long? Or is it like a corpse flower, which is not a flower you want <laughs> in your house opening up? But is it similar to that where it stinks for like a couple of days and then it doesn't stink? And by stink, I mean smell good in your case. <laughs> uh, that is a great question. And I'm going to confess, I don't know. Like when they first open, I do the smelling thing. But then mm -hmm. after a couple of days, they're there and I'm like, OK, they're there. And, you know, I don't feel the need to to partake in the fragrance anymore, which is a really interesting thing about my psychology. Huh. You got to take some time and stop and smell the flowers, Justin. I do. I do. I just thought of something. I do have one plant update I forgot about. Uh, the Clarinervium seeds that we had. That oh, I yes. Talked about in the first second. It's all blurring together on one of those episodes. They are germinating. Wow. Yeah, it's really exciting. I tried a new method this time. I put them in um, like little like spongy cells. I really should know the name of this. We don't use them. Uh, I just buy them from like a little hydroponic store. Oh, they're like spongy peat rock cells. Wool? No, not rock wool. I have oh. no. Uh, <laughs> I have, apparently have very strong opinions against rock wool. No, I don't have a, it, it, whatever, not rock wool. Um, it's another spongy thing. Anyway, I got a little impatient and I checked them and they started popping out a radical, which is a really cool name for the first root that comes out of a seed of a plant. It's radical. Uh, <laughs> and that is germination is as soon as that little radical pops. Out. I can't radical man pops out so yeah they're all pretty rad right now 
through. Nice. Once you, uh, you know, once you get a couple of leaves, I can't wait to see them. Oh, they're so cute. When they Text me a photo. Yeah, you can't tell they're clarinerviums. That's kind of the bummer with anthuriums when they first, their first like cotyledons and their first leaves, you have no idea what the thing is going to turn into. So, yeah, I'll be sure. Maybe I'll send you one. We'll oh, see. awesome. I, I don't have one. It would, I'm sure it would love my greenhouse. I'm sure it would. And I just committed to that publicly. So Exactly. Everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody can pressure me. you now. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we'll get there one day. Is that it for today? That's a wrap. Um, this episode is sponsored by Xanthosoma. Uh, one of the most exotic 2021 trending tropicals introductions is Xanthosoma with leaves like an elephant ear and beautiful golden yellow venation. Um, it is sure to be a highlight in any plant collection. Justin, I, I'm I'm sorry. I know it's let's wrap up, but I have one question. You just reminded me because you're the expert on Latin pronunciation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Xanthosoma lindenii. Is that how it's said or pronounced? You know, Latin is a dead language. Nobody <laughs> speaks it anymore. And botanical Latin was really never meant to be a spoken language. So I think you're fine saying it any way that you want to. Um, I am inclined to say lindenii. Um, isn't that what I said? I thought you said Lynn, like L L E N, whereas I say it more L I N. Oh, you're right. I may have. Okay. It's, it's your Northeastern accent compared to my Midwestern accent. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for clearing that up. Anyway, thank you very much. Xanthosoma Lynn, Lynn Denny. And thank you everybody for listening to us as always. If you have any questions, reach out. Uh, we love to feature them and talk plants with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>